The Gospel of John speaks of God's grace in rather dramatic terms. The Gospel of John speaks of God's grace in rather dramatic terms. John writes, as I read this morning, in Jesus' coming, we have all received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. Grace on top of grace. Grace abundant. Grace beyond measure. Grace far more than you and I can imagine and certainly far more than we deserve. Grace on top of grace. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, believed that God's grace permeates every single moment of every single day of our lives. Wesley said that from the moment we're born to the moment we die, our lives are filled with God's gracious activity. In one of his sermons, he said this, All the daily blessings which God bestows upon us are His mere grace, bounty, and favor. Thus, one of the central core beliefs of Methodism is that God's bountiful, favorable grace is constantly at work in our lives. And so what I want to do this morning is illustrate that for you. I want to illustrate God's grace-filled moments in your life and in mine. First of all, God's gracious activity shows up in distinctive moments in our lives. God's gracious activity shows up in distinctive moments in our lives. I didn't experience this past Thursday. In fact, that experience caused me to change this part of my sermon. I was headed to a luncheon meeting. Uh, this is Thursday, about a little afternoon. I was headed to a luncheon meeting in Lakeland. I was driving up uh, North Germantown Parkway. I was just south of Rock Creek Parkway, uh, ready to get on the interstate and head down to the Lakeland exit. When I noticed uh, at a, gra a gas station just to my right, a man who was standing out there holding a sign. I couldn't read the sign, but it was obvious the sign was probably saying, help us. The man was standing there. There was a woman who was seated on the ground, and there were two children with them at a gas station just south of Rock Creek Parkway. And so I decided to pull into the station to see what the need was, and I did. I pulled in, and and there was the, the, the man, the woman, and the two children. I discovered rather quickly that we couldn't communicate. They knew little, if any, English. I assumed they were Hispanic, and I don't speak Spanish. And so for several moments, we're trying to communicate as to what their real need is. And there are all sorts of gestures going on, especially by me. I told somebody if uh, Jimmy Fallon had seen me doing those gestures, he would have wanted that on his show. So I was trying to communicate what is their need, how can I help? And finally, I, I just said money, took some money out of my pocket and gave them the money. And there was a Waffle House directly across, across the side roadway from this service station. And I pointed to the Waffle House, gave them the money and went, and they understood that, that I was telling them that I wanted them to have something to eat. And then I tried to communicate to them that I would go to my meeting, and then I would come back if they would stay at the Waffle House. So this is Germantown Parkway, Waffle House service station. Uh, and I'm doing everything I can to say, stay, stay. Come back. I'll come back. And I never was sure that they understood that. But I needed to go to this meeting in Lakeland, so I went. And about an hour later, I came back to the Waffle House. They were outside, and there was a man with them. And he had his phone out, and I later learned that he had pulled up an Italian translator app because they were Italian, <laughs> not Hispanic. Okay, okay, I confess. And so we try to communicate with them, with that app, what's going on. And he could speak some Spanish, but, but primarily Italian. Learned he's Italian and she's Romanian. And so we're doing everything we can to communicate with this family that we want to help, this wonderful man. And by the way, let me tell you about him. Here's Germantown Parkway. There's the service station. There's the Waffle House. There's a bank right across Germantown Parkway. His wife is the manager of that bank. And he happened to be looking out the window of her office, saw the family across there, saw me pull in, saw me give them something, saw me leave, and then he followed up over at the Waffle House to see what he could do. And so this man's name is Chris, wonderful Baptist Christian from Bartlett, I've learned. We've become good friends. 
And so again, we're doing everything we can to communicate with this family. We want to help them using that Italian translator app in some Spanish. And we help them know that we're going to get them to Bartlett to an extended stay place for at least a week, get them some food. He drives their beat up old van over to Bartlett. I follow him, tell him I'll bring him back to his car at her bank, his wife's bank. And meanwhile, on my way over there, I'm calling Renee, who's my assistant, as most of you know, and I'm telling her, find a Catholic church in the Bartlett area. There, there might be a priest there, a member there who speaks Italian. And, and just find anybody you can who speaks Italian so we can communicate over the phone, at least. And wonderfully, Renee makes several calls and, 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 and ends up that the church with whom she makes contact is right down the road. It's Holy Spirit Catholic Church. Wonderful woman named Sonia Davis there, whom I will meet Thursday. And they agree to help. And she runs down a, a, ta a woman in Midtown who on the phone is willing to, to translate an Italian, but later finds a woman here in Germantown through one of our staff members who speaks Italian, goes to Italy every summer, and was absolutely thrilled with the idea that she could help this family in need. Let me tell you what we learned. They're homeless. They've been living in their car for three months. Came here from Italy, actually through a circuitous route. Landed in the States because he had heard this is a wonderful place to find work. And so they have been traveling from the West across this country and been 10 days in Memphis living in their car with a 10-year-old child and a 4-year-old child. Daniel, Felicia, Filippo, and Michele. Daniel, Felicia, uh, Philip, and Michael have been driving across this country trying to stop wherever they could to find work, and they're finding no work, almost no money, no home. And so we continue the conversation. I continue to speak with with, uh, connect with Sonia Davis at Holy Community Catholic Church and, and Chris, uh, the, the guy from Bartlett and I are still working on plans. We get them into that extended stay in Bartlett. We get them some food for a week. I connect with a translator here in Germantown. Connected her with a family yesterday. And we're going to meet with Holy Spirit Catholic Church uh, next Thursday to see what help collectively can be made on their behalf. They have papers that allow them to be here for a period of time as long as they find work. It's a challenging situation. Let me tell you why I tell you that story. First of all, because if you can help, we need to help them. Don't tell me today. I'm leaving for annual conference this afternoon. I won't remember. Email me or call Renee and say, just let me know more of the story and I'll help where I can. But here's why I'm really telling you the story. You think about this. The gracious activity of God in their lives and ours. I'm driving down Germantown Parkway. I'm actually running late for the meeting. And I drop my phone down by my seat and I can't call the person whom I'm having lunch with to tell him I'm running late. But I feel a nudge to stop for this family. Chris is across the street watching this happen. He feels a nudge to do something. There's a woman in Midtown who speaks Italian who readily leaped in to do her part. There's a Holy Spirit Catholic Church here where Sonia Davis can't wait to meet this family and do their part. And God has brought forth a, a, a translator, a lady named Mary Beth, whom I met yesterday who's going to be our primary interpreter, and her statement to me after she met the family was, if I wasn't working, I'd be with them every day. And one of the things he said to her yesterday was, as it was translated to me, I'm not afraid. Jesus is my strength. He sent me Pastor and Chris. Isn't that God? Isn't that the gracious activity of God? Who else connects the dots that way? Who else puts the pieces of the puzzle that way that good can be done in people's lives? Who taps this person and taps that person and brings forth this person and brings this forth this person that a need might be met other than the gracious God 
whom we love and whom we serve. God's gracious activity is evident in so many distinctive moments in our lives. Secondly, God's grace comes to us in our moments of spiritual brokenness. God's grace comes to us in our moments of spiritual brokenness. In another church in another city, I had a member of my congregation who's probably one of the wealthiest men I've ever known. And we've had wealthy members of every church I've ever pastored. He owned two businesses in that community. The most notable businessman in that community, without question. Extremely, extremely wealthy, extremely, extremely successful. Member of my congregation. There were also rumors that his business practices were questionable. And that, in fact, he practiced uh, disreputable business practices. I didn't know that. Didn't know him that well. One day I got a text from him, and he said, Pastor... Or Richard, can you send me some Bible verses so I can connect with God? I said, sure. So I sent him those Bible verses. About a week later, I got a call from him that he wanted to come see me. And so he came to see me, and sure enough, on his heart was the matter that he needed to get real with God. He needed to strengthen his relationship with God. He wanted to order his life. And so we met two or three times and uh, talked about that, prayed together, worked together that he might come closer to God and might know the grace of God in his life. And then he sent me this email. I've wasted so many years worrying about things that don't matter and striving for things that are just not that important. I admit that I've been way too self-involved and self-absorbed most days to even take notice of anything beyond my own drive for success and wealth. I thank God He woke me from my selfish slumber, pricked my conscience, and most importantly, is willing to heal and help my spiritual poverty. I understand now the song we sing, Amazing Grace, because it's now personal to me. It's really personal to all of us. Wherever we are in our spiritual journeys, and especially in our moments of spiritual brokenness, this God of grace is ever present with us, trying to get through to us how much He loves us and how readily His grace is available to us. Which leads me to the third insight about this sacrament. John Wesley said that the sacrament of Holy Communion, I've said this before, is a channel of God's grace. That every time you and I come and take of these elements, far beyond what we can imagine, far beyond what we know, God's touching us with grace. You see, this sacrament's not about you, it's about God. It's not about whether you're here willingly or reluctantly. It's about God. And when you come and take these elements, this gift of God in the name of Jesus Christ, Wesley says, beyond what you and I can possibly know, God's grace is touching us. So the very act of coming and taking this sacrament, Wesley said, is a channel through which God comes to touch you and me with grace. Thanks be to God. God's gracious activity is present in distinctive moments of our lives. God's grace is especially with us in our spiritually broken moments. And God's grace is really available in this sacrament. Maya Angelou died this past Wednesday. I think you know that. I hope you know that. Wonderful poet, prophet, activist, philosopher. Died at 86 years of age in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. One of my favorite pieces from Maya Angelou is called Christians. I've shared it before. And in remembrance of her and in celebration of God's grace, let me offer these closing words to this message. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not showing I'm clean living. I'm whispering I was lost, now I'm found and forgiven. When I say I am a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need Christ to be my guide. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and need His strength to carry on. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. 
I'm admitting I have failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I am a Christian, I still feel, feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon His name. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not holier than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's grace somehow. Thanks be to God.